uh, be light. And we are now to the book of Proverbs, which means we have a ways to go yet. The book of Proverbs can be looked upon kind of as wisdom's traffic light. Ephesians 5.8 tells us, as the foundation of our series, you were once darkness, but now you are in the light. Live as children of light. The book of Proverbs serves as that wisdom's traffic light, instructing us when to go, when to stop, when to be cautious. As we honor our high school graduates today, this is especially a good message for them. As they move forward in the next stages of their lives, planning for their futures, but it is a message for all of us who desire to honor God. I really appreciate the testimonial that uh, Marcia just gave because what she really was talking about was listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in saying, and you, I hope you caught that, if you buy this object of art, the art in itself is not offensive to God, but the funds that you're going to be paying for that are going to support a philosophy and a religion that opposes the truth of God's word. That's why the Spirit spoke to her and said, don't get it. Even though when she told me earlier, like she said with us here a few moments ago, it would have looked really good on our, my mantle. It would have been like just the right thing. But the fact that she would have been supporting through a fundraiser an organization that does not believe in the true word of God the Holy Spirit said, don't do it. And she was obedient. And the feeling she had afterward was relief, joy that she heard and listened to, the word, to, to God himself. And then an opportunity to share why she didn't purchase this item. This morning, Carol Mackey gave me an article from the paper. And I was, that's why I left during that last song was because it's like, oh, this is going to fit in really good too. Because in this article, and I read it just quickly, it's an article by a political analysis, uh, the Roberts, that's a husband and wife team. And they're talking, of course, about the next presidential election and the two candidates, primary candidates that are going to be out there. One of those candidates, Romney, was speaking at the Liberty University, which is an evangelical college. And, of course, uh, Romney is a Mormon by faith. And so there was, there's this, is there a clash that's happening here? And then, of course, Romney and his political positions is different than President Obama's. And so she writes this article about faith as it's kind of intermingled with politics, if you will. She said Romney had made this statement, and this is how she writes it. Romney could have been giving uh, the voices of tacit encouragement when he said, from the beginning, this nation trusted in God, not man. She goes on to write, that's certainly true in one sense, our core national canon, that all men are created equal, is deeply rooted in religious principles. The founders made the, that link explicit in the Declaration of Independence, writing that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. But Romney was wrong in another sense. Americans have never trusted God to tell us how those inalienable rights should be practiced and protected. We are profoundly pragmatic people. God might inspire us, but she does not think or plan or vote for us. We know that human beings, faithful but fallible, make the choices, set the priorities, and build the institutions that translate those rights into living doctrines. As a member of the religious minority, at times a persecuted minority, Romney should have been sensitive to that. Then she goes on and talks about the fact that when you begin to be exclusive and say only God knows how we should live our lives, that's how you get uh, jihadists and religious wars where people kill each other, is how she makes the connection. This morning we're talking about the wisdom of God. It is a traffic light. And I'm here to tell you, I know that, and she talks about people of intolerance, and you can't just go on. She mentions in the article, you can't just say there's only one way to God. There are many paths to God. Same thing that uh, Marcia was talking about in this group. Folks, I'm here to tell you, this is the word of God, and it says there is only one way. 
There is only one way. I would, I would, in my humanity, I would say it'd be nice if there were other ways. But then the purpose of Jesus dying is mute. He died to pay for the penalty of the sins of humanity. In Acts 4.12, it said, There is no one but the name of Jesus in which one can be saved. There is no other way. That's why we as Christians need to be very vocal and very aggressive in sharing our faith and practicing our faith in front of others so that they can see that hope. In the book of Proverbs, we're going to go with the, with the traffic light concept. The first is the green light signals go. The scripture says at the very beginning of the book of Proverbs, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now last week we talked, oops, I told you I'd just keep these on. Come here, hard. I told you last week that, um, wis- that we are to live or fear God with a healthy fear. And I mentioned like a child being taught not to touch a hot stove. The heat of the stove is there to provide for us cooking. The heat of a furnace is there to provide heat during cold days that we have in our lives. A campfire is there to bring kind of an atmosphere of of fun and, and camping and warmth and cooking. But if you enter into that fire, foolishly, you will get burned. We need to fear the flames and utilize them according to the way they're designed for our benefit, not to hurt us. So the fear of the Lord is that we love Him and we utilize God's blessing on us and God's person in us to benefit us. But if we violate God's principles, we can get burned. And so the fear of the Lord... The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. In Proverbs 1.7, it says that, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools say, and I don't mean to speak directly to the person who wrote this article, because it is the philosophy of the day, but fools say there are many paths to God. Fools say you don't have to limit yourself. You don't have to be intolerant of everybody else. Truth is not intolerance. It's it's direction. We must first of all fear God in such a way that we live and we believe that we are going to go forward, the green light, in following God's path and God's path alone. The growth of wisdom is trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 says those very words, and many of us have learned these at childhood. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own philosophies. Don't lean on your own emotions. Don't lean on your own feelings about how life should happen. Can we understand the fullness of God? No, we cannot. That's where faith comes in and trust comes in. We must trust that when he tells us to live a certain way, it is for our benefit and for his glory. When he says there is only one path to living with God and being in his kingdom, then we must believe that it's true. And that even though there might be another person who seems to have good morals, if they do not accept Christ as their Savior and have asked Christ to forgive them of their sins... They are good in the eyes of man, but they are still separated from God in the eyes of God. So the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The growth of wisdom is trust in the Lord. The path of wisdom is relationship with the Lord. Proverbs 3, 6. In all your ways acknowledge Him. In all your ways trust Him. In all the ways lean on Him. And He will make your path straight. He will guide you and guide me in how we ought to live our lives every day. That's the green light, that we go into God and we follow God according to His purposes. The yellow light signals caution. Contrary to popular belief, when you're driving your car and the light turns yellow, it doesn't mean speed up. It means slow down. 
And I know my wife's going to come at me and go, you hypocrite. <laughs> but that's really what it means. It means that, you're, you're, that the lights are changing, so you need to be cautious because there's going to be traffic coming the opposite direction pretty soon. The yellow light signals caution. In Proverbs 1, 2, and 4, it t- tells us to learn wisdom and let it govern your life. In other words, be cautious how you live your life. Verse 2 says, To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. All right, learn wisdom. Let it govern your life. If you want to learn how to live your life, if you want to learn how to make good decisions, wise decisions, decisions where the Spirit begins to prompt you, even in the simplest things like buying an art object that you want to put on your mantle, then we must learn from God and allow God to govern our lives. There must be wise instruction. Verse 2 says that. No wisdom and instruction. That's the caution. Instruction says this is how you need to proceed. This is where you need to stop. There's a caution light that says be careful now. You may be entering into dangerous ground if you go one direction or the other. In chapter 24, verse 32, it says it this way. When I saw... I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. The reflection is I heard the instruction, I saw what I was supposed to do, and I processed it. That's the caution in life. I'm thinking through what's happening and what am I supposed to do in this case. We're also supposed to have wise behavior. Verse 3 says to receive instruction is wise behavior. In other words, to allow God to speak into our lives is wise behavior. He wants to speak into us righteousness, justice, and equity. In chapter 16 of Proverbs, and by the way, we're not going to go through the whole book, as you can imagine, but in chapter 16 of Proverbs, verse 1 through 3, it writes, uh, the wisdom of Proverbs says this, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of man are clean in his own sight. In other words, we make justifications. Marcia's testimony talked about that. Well, Lord, it's not that bad of a deal. It's a nice piece of art, and, and you know, it's only a little bit of money. That's the way we think. The ways of man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Commit your, work, your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. Commit and surrender to God and the future decisions, the decisions that we are going to encounter in day in and day out, whether they're major ones or they're what we consider minor ones, will be decisions that honor God and bring blessing to our lives. That's wise behavior. We need to be cautious that we walk in that way. And then there's wise judgment, verse 4 in number 1, to give prudence to the naive and to the youth, knowledge and discretion. My wife and I have had multiple discussions about what we see in our youth today, from the littlest to the uh, college age. And I'm not speaking against the youth. What we were talking about in our discussion is what's going on in the family structure, where kids are telling us so matter-of-factly about abuse that takes place in their homes. I mean, we're not, we're not inquiring, we're not investigating. They're just talking about it like this is normal. This is the way life is. And it may be what is normal for them, but it's not the way God designed family, is it? It's because that wise judgment and behavior and instruction is evaporating from the family units. And it says here in Proverbs 1.4, that if we listen to God, it gives prudence to the naive and to youth, knowledge and discretion. We are seeing in family structures, generations, where this wisdom of God is completely absent from the home. In chapter 22 of Proverbs, 
It speaks of the same issue in verses 1 through 10. A good name to be is to be more desired than wealth, great wealth. A good name, in other words, a good reputation. Favor is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is maker of them all. The prudent sees the evil and hides himself. In other words, we don't chase after it, but we hide from it. The naive go on, engage in it, and are punished for it. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Hear that. The reward of humility, those who humble themselves before God, are riches, honor, and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards himself will be far from them. Parents, listen especially to this, because I believe this truth is so, so true. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. It doesn't say expose a child. It says train a child. There will be in children those rebellious natures. There, that is in all of us. We go through what's called the teen years where teenagers are trying to establish and identify their future and their, their ability to make decisions. And you know the hardest thing as a parent to do is to let your child make a wrong decision. You want to hover over them. And I'm a parent. I do the same thing. Sometimes there's a term actually in the world today called helicopter parent. That's a parent that hovers over their child, trying to protect their child from making wrong decisions. But I'm here to tell you that sometimes we have to allow our children to make choices, and they'll make wrong choices, sometimes choices that will affect their future. And we don't want them to make those choices, but we can't be with them all the time. But if we allow them to make choices when they're younger, and when when the consequence of that choice won't be as major, they will begin to understand there are always consequences to making wrong choices. If we hover over them and smother them when they're young and then they decide to go out and hide from our the parents' tutelage, it can be a major decision that destroys their future because they never knew what it was to make a wrong dis- choice. Now, I know that goes tilt. You don't want your children to make wrong choices. But one of the things my children have told me, my grown children, is that you allowed us to make choices. And sometimes we made stupid ones. And of course, I'll agree with them. (laughs) But as a parent, sometimes I made wrong choices. And I have to explain to my children they were wrong choices. It is looking for instruction and behavior and judgment. Continuing on in Chapter 10, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower, the borrower becomes the lender's slave. In other words, if you're going to borrow money, you become slave to whoever you borrowed the money from. Family or institutions, it doesn't matter. You owe them, and you become their slave, is what the Scripture says. He who sows iniquity, he who does evil, he who plants and sows sin will reap vanity, and the rod of, the fur- of his fury will perish. He who is generous will be blessed, but he who gives some of his food to the poor, for he gives some of his food to the poor. Drive out the scoffers and contention will go out. Even strife and dishonor will cease. These are all the caution lights. Listen to what God's saying. Our world today is not living according to wisdom of God. It wants you to go into debt. It wants you to make decisions that are tolerant of everybody else's decision and not according to the word of God. But we are the signal lights of caution, our instruction, wise behavior, wise judgment, and finally wise training. Verse 4 and 5 of chapter 1 Give, uh, we just read this, to give prudence to the naive, to the young, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. In other words, we will go after the teachings of God. And a man of understanding 
one who sits and ponders and begins to allow it to develop his character will acquire wise counsel. In 20, chapter 22, verse 6, we just read that. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. I remember our friend Dwayne Damaris telling me one time that when he grew up in a church, it, it just it, the, the things that the church was telling him, he didn't agree with all of it, and he didn't want to listen to it, but when he was older... He says the scriptures that were taught to him in his growing up period and through his confirmation, he said that is what grabbed him. The Holy Spirit used that which had been embedded in him and brought him to a faith in Christ. Train up a child. They may walk away from it for a while, but at least they have the foundation of truth embedded in them for their future that the Spirit of God can work with. Finally, the red light. The green light is to go in the wisdom and the fear of the Lord and His trust, trust in Him, to have a relationship with Him. The caution light is to learn wisdom and govern, let it govern your life with wise instruction, wise behavior, wise judgment, and wise training. The red light signals stop. In other words, don't go there. And that's what the book of Proverbs can give us. Stop ignoring the wisdom of your parents. Ha <laughs> ha, I love that one because I'm a parent. Believe it or not, parents sometimes understand the things of God and because of our experiences and our mistakes, we caution you not to make the same mistakes. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9 says, Hear, my son, my daughter, your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are graceful wreaths to your head, ornaments around your neck. In other words, these are things that beautify you if you listen to them. Because parents have made mistakes. We have learned how rough life can be. We know the dangers that are out there. And even though we are not your age any longer, and if we try to live that age, it is an act of foolishness, we do have something to offer you because we have seen the evils that are out there. We've experienced it. And we're trying to protect you and guide you for your future. Especially godly parents who understand how important it is to follow God's plan. Stop hanging with bad company, the scripture says in Proverbs 1, 8 through 16. We just read the first two. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us. Let us lie and wait for blood. In other words, let's do evil. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive like Sheol, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious wealth. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Throw your, in your lot with us. We shall ha all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. And I know some of you are thinking, especially younger ones, well, my friends aren't trying to kill anybody. But the shedding of blood can be taken to the point of just dishonoring God and doing evil in His sight. Last week, my father um, had a friend who died. It was a friend's wife, actually. And he wanted to go to the funeral. And so, because my dad is not very mobile, I took him to the funeral. And the woman that died, he had introduced this woman to his surviving, uh, the spouse, the surviving spouse who's 92, and he had introduced them at a picnic that they went to. And eventually they got married. And so uh, my dad and this friend, his friend Ray have known each other since they were 10 years old. And my dad's 89 and Ray's 92. So it was a very important thing for my dad to be there. There was a group of ladies um, that were there. And, the only, and, and this woman that died was a part of that group. They called themselves a KYB club. 
And my mom was a part of that club, and my mom with her dementia was not uh, allowed to go or couldn't go to the funeral. But I sat down at this table, and there was all these ladies, and my dad and myself, and I, and I asked uh, my dad's cousin, Eileen, who was a missionary for many years, uh, retired in, out of Ethiopia, Eritrea. And I said, what does KYB stand for? I've heard it growing up. You guys always get together. And they said, it stands for Know Your Bible. It was a Bible club. And I said, well, that's really interesting. Well, well, my dad, they had this open mic. And my dad was started off telling a story. And, uh, and he said that they were, as kids, they, they were pretty good kids. And the whole KYB group just kind of, uh, uh, like, that's not true. And everybody kind of chuckled. Well, at the reception... I began to hearing stories about my father as a child, stories I hadn't heard before. <laughs> One of those was that the, they called themselves the Pierce Street Gang because they lived on Pierce Street in northern Minneapolis. It wasn't gang like we think of today. It was more like the Sugar Creek Gang or, or you know, the, the Little Rascals, more of a gang like that. But they said that they'd go out and, and find all these little small tomatoes and then they would ambush cars that drove through the alleyway, always making first it wasn't one of their parents that came through, and the car windows had to be open or they didn't, they didn't shoot at them. Now, that sounds like little fun, and I'm not telling you kids to do this. You get in big trouble if you do. But it, made, it reminded me of that when I was reading this scripture that says they will entice you and say, come on, let's do this. That's how friendships and peer groups work. It's just innocent fun. No one's going to get hurt, and that's what you hope for. But the reality is, is you're practicing evil in those kinds of situations. And Scripture says, stop doing that. Don't hang with bad company. Hanging with bad company will develop bad character. That's what the book of Proverbs is telling us. That's why as a parent, I'm, we're trying to be very careful about when our children are growing up and our son now, and you are doing the same, that who are you hanging with? What's their family life like? What do they believe in? Do they, do they know that you're even coming to their house? And of course, young people and children especially, sometimes like, Dad, they're friends. I know but I want to know what kind of friends you're developing and what are the things that they choose to do. Will it honor God or dishonor them? Honor Him. Stop tempting the perverse. In chapter 2, 12 through 19, it says in Proverbs, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. For those who leave the path of righteousness, who wa to walk in the ways of darkness, people will try to entice you to do that. Who delights in doing evil and rejoices in the perversity of evil? Whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways? To deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flat, flatters with her words, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house stinks down to death and her track leads to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. This is talking about sexual perversion. And there will be men and there will be women out there that try to entice you into doing the things that God says don't be a part of it unless you are in marriage. You are married with one another. Don't be enticed into premarital sex. Don't be enticed into having sex outside of your marriage family. That's the red light. It's an absolute. It's not like, well, we're in love. We feel this love. Then save it for that special moment when marriage happens and celebrate it then. Stop walking in darkness. Chapter 4, verses 18 and 19 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. In other words, it just gets better and more glorious. The way of the wicked is like darkness, and they do not know over what they are stumbling. They're tripping and falling and hurting themselves by practicing it. Stop living for lust. Chapter 5, 1 through 9. nine excuse me, 1 through 19. says, My son, give attention to my, and my wisdom. 
Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may observe discretion. Your lips may reserve knowledge, for the lips of an adulteress drip honey. And by the way, when it talks about an adulteress, it's speaking of anyone that would have sexual relationships outside of their own marriage. Okay? It doesn't mean just a man and woman who are married that are being unfaithful. It's talking about anyone that is unfaithful in the area of sexuality apart from uh, if it's not done within context of their own marriage. Smoother than oil is her speech. In other words, she or he is very enticing. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. They will bring you down. Her steps take hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the part of life. Her ways are unstable, and she does not know it. In other words, engaging in that activity seems the right thing to do, seems pleasurable, seems like it's okay, but in the end, it is destructive. Now then, my sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, or you will give your vigor to others and your, your years to the cruel one. Strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien. And you're grown at your final end, when your flesh and your body are consumed, and you say, How I have hated instruction, and my heart spurned reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my teachers, nor inclined to my ear to my instructors. I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly of the congregation. This is a, a euphemism here, or an allegory. Drink water from your own cistern. In other words, if you're married, you can engage in sexual activity with one another but only drink water from your own cistern, fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you all the time to be exhilarated always with her love. Why should you, my son, my daughter, be exhilarated with somebody else and embrace the bosom of a foreigner. Don't go there. That's the stoplight. There's too much pain involved when you do. Stop living for lust and stop party drinking. Proverbs has a number of passages, scriptures, I'm not going to go through all of them, that talks about alcohol and its evils. I started back in 2009, I believe it was, I was on a committee here in the community to uh, investigate and to talk about the area of alcoholism in Hibbing. I, never, I knew it was bad. I didn't know how bad it is, and it is bad. Binge drinking and alcoholism are a way of life in our community. It's a part of our culture, and one of the reasons part of our culture is because adults are saying, well, I don't want them to drink somewhere else, so I'm going to invite them to drink here. We, that, that committee even, even was able to get an ordinance passed that, that you can get arrested if a party happens in your house and you're not even there if children, minors are involved. We have to put a stop to the evils of excessive alcoholism in our community. It starts with adults and works its way down to children. Sol Solomon, I want you to know, Solomon who wrote the Proverbs, he drank. He drank wine. All right? He's not talking about drinking. He's talking about the abuse of alcohol. The red light is to stop party drinking. In chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Chapter 23, verse 30, says this as it speaks to alcoholism. Those who linger long over wine, those who go to taste mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup. It goes down smoothly. Goes on to speak in verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? It's those who linger 
long over wine. Matter of fact, I'm jumping around here and forgive me for that. Verse 32, at last this alcohol, it bites like a serpent. It stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your mind will utter perverse things. You will be like the one who lies down in the middle of the sea or like one who lies down on the top of a mast. In other words, you will be delusional with getting drunk and partying and so forth. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will see another drink. Let's talk about someone that's really connected to alcohol. Stop party drinking is the wisdom of God. Don't get involved with it. It does not help you. It may seem like a, a fun thing, a frivolous thing to do. It's just, we're just having fun with friends. But the reality, it brings you down and it begins to addict you and it begins to destroy your future. There are many other things in the book of Proverbs and I just can't go through all of them. So I'm going to encourage you. In today's message, we have merely scratched the surface of all the wisdom given in the book of Proverbs. It is truly like a traffic light, the book for our lives. Go in this direction, be cautious here, and stop doing certain practices. Matter of fact, in the book of Proverbs, it, it touches on the following subjects. Adultery, anger, borrowing, bribes, chastening, death, dis discipline, drinking and drunkenness, enemies, family life. Fear, food, fools, gossip, love, poor, pride, riches, sin, sleep, sluggards, or laziness, the ways of life, wives, and wisdom. It's there. To live such wisdom is to know such wisdom. I want to show you something here, and I have to take my glasses off to do it. I got a bunch of balloons here. They're all marked with funny things. There's one marked alcohol, okay? Here's, well, I'll tell you what they are before I pick them up. There's self, there's education, there's friends, there's fun, there's, what's that one? There's feelings, there's a worldview, there's politics, which is misspelled, so I should have did that one with education. There's philosophy, and there's lying, and there's a whole bunch of others. What I want to do is kind of show you what this is for, okay? If we're not following the wisdom of God, if we're not following the word of God, then we're following the things of man. Let's say it's alcohol. So I, it's alcohol, I like it, so I'm going to hang on to it. Well, here's sexuality, I'm going to hang on to that. And here's feelings, I'm going to hang on to that because that's what drives some of this stuff. And then, of course, there's, there's self, that's what I want. Oh, wait, there goes my sex life. And then I go over here, and then, and then there's, there's, there's the worldview. Oh, and I lost that for a second. And see, I'm going to chase this now. This is, uh, what is this, tradition. These are the traditions of my life. So I'm going to hang on to that. Oh, I lost that one. But now I'm going after this one. You see what's happening when I'm chasing the world's things? <laughs> Self? How providential is that? <laughs> my self-image has dropped terribly. Thank you, Lord. That was good. But you see, that's what happens. If we're chasing all those things, we can't control them. And we're chasing after them. We think, well, that's where I should go, and that's where I should go. This is what makes me feel good. And here is the Word of God. It's stable. It's able to handle it as we surrender ourselves to the Lord Himself. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Some of these things here, actually all these things here, I don't think there was any evil here. It's how we want them and how we abuse them that makes them evil in God's sight. God says, there's a plan I have for you. It's a plan to make you better. It's a plan to bless you. It's a plan to develop your life so that when you're engaged in these things, all of it happens under God's guidance and God's direction. To live such wisdom is to know such wisdom. The book of Proverbs contains 31 chapters. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a goal to shoot for. Start today, if you haven't done this already, to practice this. If you want to learn the wisdom of God, obviously the whole Bible is God's word, but if you want to learn some of the practical things we talked about today, read one chapter of Proverbs every day. Match the chapter you're reading according to the day of the week. So like today's the 20th, today you would read Proverbs 20. Tomorrow's the 21st, so you'd read Proverbs 21. 
and just keep doing that, rotating that. And I realize not every month has 31 days. But if we continue to do that, the things that God's trying to instill in us in terms of the wisdom of fearing God and honoring Him will begin to become a part of our thinking, a part of our choice making, a part of our philosophy, a part of our faith. That is what God wants of us, is to be like the image of God. You know, you and I were once darkness, but now we are light. So live as children of light. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward, and as they do, I'm going to ask our three graduates